Jamie, Victoria, quick, over here. It's, it's Fury from the Deep, quick. I'll have to open it. Um, hold on. I have to borrow this sonic screwdriver from one of my successors because my one's missing. I dropped it um, somewhere. I think it was in a... Um, oh, yeah, this is going to be difficult to open with one hand. Uh, give me a minute. There we go. Oh, oh it's a slip case. Oh, okay. Well, here's the real deal. So, um... Oh, hello, Brian. Dude. Ah, that looks like some of my other cells are there. Not the ones that let me disc. There was another one, kind of, between eight and nine. Yeah. Oh, looks nice. Here you go. Oh, looks like COVID's affected that um, DVD casting that power had. Whoops. Oh, well. Anyway, time to put it back in the slip case. This is what happens when you film from a distance whilst trying to open it with only one hand. Oh, to 12, probably due to that slide audio drama. There we are, all done. Hmm, neat, isn't it? All done with sound waves. Speaking of sound, what is that sound behind? Oh, God! No! 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 Hello everybody, Nick here. Did you enjoy Russell T Davies month? At time of recording for me, it's still going on, but I'm enjoying it. So I hope you enjoyed it um, now that it's finished at time of this video going out. So that now RTD era is over, I can now finally talk about Fury from the Deep. Yay! The new, well at time of this video going out, of course, when um, future videos go out, it won't be as new and there may be other animations. <laughs> in the future. But yeah, Fury from the Deep, uh, time recording, the latest Doctor Who animated um, remake, um, reanimated story, um, where they animated missing episodes. In this case, it's a complete story, um, making this the third complete animated story following The Power of the Daleks and the Macra Terror. And the fifth um, one produced by BBC Studios following The Power of the Daleks, Sharda, the Macro Terror and the Faceless Ones. This is also the first one to be directed by Gary Russell, who previously directed The Infinite Quest and Dreamland, as well as um, worked in other areas of the Doctor Who, um, uh, Doctor Who universe. Yeah, I just say universe, the Doctor Who universe, notably being Doctor Who mag being a Doctor Who magazine editor for a, quite a while, and also being the script editor of David Tennant's final three episodes. He's also joined by a fellow director, Luke Mac Mar Maracati, um, as this production was probably the most global of all of the Doctor Who animated projects so far. So the plot of this story sees the Doctor, Jamie and Victoria arrive on the Kent coast, where they are in a restricted area belonging to a gas company who is pumping gas from the North Sea. They are subsequently captured, but soon they, everyone is realising that something is going on. There's been a problem around um, the, the gas company for quite a while, and the Doctor, Jamie and Victoria believe they've heard some banging in a pipe they examined earlier. Fun fact, this is the first scene where the sonic screwdriver, this is the War Doctor's version by the way, is introduced. It turns out it's seaweed that's gotten into the pipelines, and it's seaweed and foam that is attacking uh, the rigs out at sea, and is starting to attack certain members of the main base on the coast. Um, it turns out that this creature is a mythological creature um, that is using seaweed and foam as a way to take over mankind. However, Chief Robson, the guy in charge, isn't doesn't want to shut down the pipe work to make engineering works on the project and doesn't really believe that um there could be a a, a, a non-mechanical fault with the situation this ultimately comes his down be uh, un, uh down doing um 
as he gets taken over by the weed, as well as um, his second in command's wife, Mrs. Um, Harris. So Mr. Harris has to step up to take command when Robson ta gets take taken over. We also have a Dutchman, Mr. Van uh, Van Loon, I believe, Mr. Van Loon, um, who's also there to give technical advice, and he's also a prominent character throughout the story. Uh, before being taken by the weed as well and as the story goes along some characters will be taken over by the weed and some char and new characters will um, be brought in to help out with the situation and the doctor and company have to find a way to stop the, the evil weed before it takes over mankind so that's more or less fury from the deep now what do i think fit well before i rewatched i watched this animated version i'd seen this story twice in reconstruction and i wasn't terribly impressed with it i thought it was good but it was I didn't I didn't see it as a classic like everybody else. I thought it was okay, but not really a ma not a masterpiece, not as great as everybody else says it is. Then after watching the animated version, and I loved it. I thought this was a brilliant story. This is a and this is another Doctor Who classic indeed. But like Enemy of the World, you really do need the visuals to appreciate it. Unlike Stuart Harty, who adores the Fury from the Deep soundtrack, I couldn't really get into the story in its reconstruction format. But with the animation, it was a masterpiece, uh, or at least nearly. So I'll touch upon the animation first. First of all, um, when I saw that um, the, the cover and the um, images of the characters, I wasn't terribly certain. I wasn't sure... Um, whether it be uh, that great, um, the animation would be that great. And when the first trailer came out, I was also a bit worried. Everybody loved that first trailer, but I, I just thought it. I thought there was some. The animation wasn't quite up to scratch for this one. Um, and then when it came out, I thought it was really great. It was great animation. There's a few inconsistencies, like some of the um, voice um, voices don't lash up, uh, line up with some of the. Um, vocal movement uh, movements of the um, like in the scene where Mrs. Harris is um, t um, knocked out by that um, gas thing by Mr. Oak and Mr. Quill when she's talking the, the lips don't quite uh, line up this is difficult for animation especially using audio that was recorded from television it's not new audio like with Shada but yeah that was a few niggles um, and besides that I don't there's not really much wrong with the animation i thought it was some really um great animation i will say this I, i'm not sure i can't quite remember what he was like in the original episode but mr quill in this episode he definitely has a more goofy facial expression in the animation um this this could be the case in the actual episodes where he did have a kind of a goofy face when he does his smiles in the animated version he does look quite goofy um i also think the animation actually does knock the um creepiness of that particular scene with him and Mr. Oak um, knocking out Mrs. Uh, Harris. I think that one does take, devalue some of the creepiness from the um, original one. But nevertheless, it's still a really great um, animated project. So the team should be commended for uh, their hard work on it. And some really great stuff um, with the animated episodes. Apparently the bits in episode 6 where the helicopter was flying around the different seaweed was added to add more action and, ten uh, action and tension as opposed to in the original one where it was just for more the helicopter flying around was for more comedy value, according to a behind-the-scenes documentary, at least. Um, so that, that was done really well. In fact, it was those two scenes, the, um, the creepy Mr. Oak and Mr. Quill knocking out Mrs. Harris scene and the helicopter scene, which were the ones I was particularly looking forward to seeing how they would do an animation. Sorry, that was Sonic Screwdriver. Um, but yeah, I think they've handled it really well. Um, I also... Actually, I don't know if I would say I like Robson as a character, but I found him far less annoying here than I did back in the reconstruction version. I think I got, because of the animation version, was able to show him the movements. And also, because I could see what he was um, looked like and what he was doing, I could appreciate the actor uh, um, doing his performance more. I thought he did a brilliant job in the role. Um, so I'm able to appreciate Robson's actor and Robson as a character more thanks to this um, version. Otherwise, he would have ended up as one of those characters for the first half of the story, like I uh, like I thought in the um, the original in the reconstruction version. Those characters are a term I use for characters who just piss me off. Like they will do some, they will do stuff throughout the in the story that just make me want to 
punch them in the face all the time. They're so idiotic. They're so stupid. And they're so irritating. I mean, there's there's a difference between irritating character, irritating and annoying characters, and just characters I want to and stupid characters and antagonistic characters. And then there's just characters I want to punch in the face and shout, get over yourself. In the reconstruction version, that might have been my opinion of Robson, but here I think he's a pretty great character, if slightly um, off, off hinged and a little bit dickish to begin with. Though to be honest, I think his Descent into Madness here is much better than um, the villain. What was his name? Not Todd, that was one of the allies. Um, one of, whoever that villain was in Kinder. The human villain, not um, the not the Mara, um, <clears throat> or whatever that idiot's name was. Um, his descent into madness was. I don't, I don't think that was very well done. But here, Robson has a very good descent into madness, with him kind of losing his grip before being taken over by the weed, and then his mind's kind of um, da uh, kind of messed about with by the weed. I thought that was done really well. Um, I also enjoyed um, the other supporting characters. Mr. Harris was a great supporting character, and I really enjoyed him. I also enjoyed Mrs. Her Harris as well in this story. <clears throat> it's quite creepy at the end of part three when she goes into the sea at the very end after meeting up with a now-possessed Robson. She gets possessed as well. They were supposed to get Mr. Harris, but they got her instead. Oh, well, I guess they thought, like, well, we got one of them. Well, it'll do. <clears throat> I also like um, Van Lutchens. <laughs> he's like, he, like um, Harris. He's kind and me. He's getting a bit pissed with Robson half the time. So um, he's kind of my in um, in story frustration um, being ex um, being sh um, displayed on screen um, towards Robson. <laughs> um, sadly, he um, gets taken by the weeds during the events of Part Four as well, which is a shame because he was a great character. I liked him. Um, uh, he was Dutch, by the way, so Dutch fans can be glad to know that they've got a Dutch character in a Doctor Who story. Woo! Um, also have the Chief, who's a nice supporting character. And there's also this other guy who works at the desk who's fun for a few stories. Though when he, towards the end, he gets um, so scared he's frozen to move. And he um, it's the Doctor who has to press a button that he's telling this guy to do. Um, so that they can help stop weed. In the actual episode... Um, uh, that guy is able to give the Doctor a hint of where the, the connector switch is. But in the animated version, it's not really made clear. As the Doctor doesn't really get um, up close to him like in the in the live action version. There's also this lady from the Ministry whose uh, name escapes me at this very moment. But I do know she's played by the actress who goes on to play Grandma Colony in, uh, Colony in The Idiot's Lantern in 2007. So a good 40 years after this story was aired. And her assistant Hawkins. Hawkins doesn't do an awful lot. But um, the ministry lady played by Margaret John. Does do quite a bit. And she's, um, she's a pretty good character. For when she's on screen. And of course our main characters are great. I especially love that they give um, the Doctor and Victoria. Another quiet moment to talk at this point. Uh, around part four in this story. Like they did in part three of The Tomb of the Sidemen which is one of my favourite stories of all time. And it's great that we have a bit more of, the, of um, the emotional character growth in this story. Classic Who isn't really that well known for its um, character growth bar occasional scenes, like that scene in Tomb, a scene at the end of Dalek Invasion of Earth, the end of The Green Death, um, <clears throat> Adric's death in Earthshock, and so forth. There isn't really a huge amount of emotion or emotional moments of, um, in the story or emotional development or even that much character growth. Um apart from a few occasions, the most notable being season 26 with Ace. Um, but but I think this is a great moment of the Doctor and Victoria having a scene where they could talk about it, and uh, Victoria is getting a bit sick of the lifestyle at the moment, and she's starting to wonder whether she doesn't want to carry on. And it's a nice moment in part four where she talks to the Doctor about it. Um, although Jamie doesn't seem to understand as much, but it's nice that she has a few scenes with the Doctor and Jamie to express her opinions through uh, talking as opposed to having to cry about it all the time. Um, Victoria does cry and scream a little bit in this story, but uh, the st it turn turns out her screams are important to just um, stopping the creatures, which I suppose put her screams to good use, but at the same time feels like a... Um, okay, that's really all the character was needed for. Um, the climax is done a little bit quickly, but we do have a couple minutes to wrap up the story with the supporting characters before seeing Victoria's departure. I think this is a very good departure where Victoria's still one, not quite certain whether she wants to leave just yet and still um, needs a little bit of time before making her final decision. 
And we again, we get a nice scene between her and Jamie. And apparently the Doctor's gone swimming, which is a nice reference to Enemy of the World. Um, but yeah, uh, this is but the final scenes with Victoria, the scientist stay on Earth with the Harrises is, is a nice scene. And it's a, a nice way for a companion to go. It's a good companion exit. Certainly better than Ben and Polly's from the faceless ones. I should also quickly mention the acting is also really great. Brilliant acting and some great character work throughout this story. So Fury from the Deep, this is a really great story, really entertaining, really enjoyable. The idea of uh, evil foam and seaweed could be a bit silly when you think about it, but when you actually see it, it's still pretty um, pretty creepy how foam and sea is coming to life and attacking the base. And it, I, when I saw the reconstruction versions, I thought it was just foam and seaweed just somehow got to life, maybe some economical thing, but apparently it's some sort of creature that they've explained in a scene in part three in the TARDIS. Um, which makes a lot of sense that it's some sort of creature. I don't know whether it could be considered alien. It's not really said it's alien, but it could be an earthbound creature like the Silurians. It could be an earth, uh, earth creature that's now started attacking this base and they need to destroy it through sound. Um, and it's a, the creature is attacking the base through seaweed and foam. And it's quite an interesting concept, really. <clears throat> it sounds silly on when you hear about it the first time, but when you actually see the story, it's it's an interesting concept and it's pretty creepy in scenes. Furthermore, the possessed humans can add the creeping value up a, a bit. Not so much in the animated version, but definitely in the original live action version, they were able to add the creepiness up a little bit more. Though there are still some creepy bits in the animated version, it is uh, pretty creepy. Originally, I gave Fury from the Deep a 5 out of 10, but that was with the reconstruction version. With this animated version, it is up to my opinion um, quite a lot. And now I shall be giving it a more than deserved 9 out of 10. Yeah, I don't think it's 100% perfect. Um, it's not quite good enough to get to 10, but, you know, it's still a, a great story. Um, deserving of being called a classic and a, a really great adventure. And I definitely recommend the, you see the animated version. It looks brilliant. Um, so that's it from this review. Thank you for watching. And I'll see you guys next time, whatever that may be. Goodbye. I'm not supposed to do that. Well, actually, it, it does, but um, means that something's wrong. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's coming for me. No. 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 Oh, it's gone. Okay. All right. Um, goodbye, I guess.